In this video, I'm going to be talking about memory. In fact, this is the first in a series of videos where I will be talking about memory. So before we start off, I should probably clarify, what am I doing differently? Hasn't memory been discussed enough already? Well, yes, but the problem is there is so much that has been discussed about memory that it's often difficult to tie it all together in a coherent way that makes sense. And that's what I'm trying to do in this series of videos, simply because memory is actually one of the most important subsystems as far as uh, SQL Server is concerned. And Microsoft has often mentioned that a lot of the algorithms and logic that's available inside SQL Server uh, software is dedicated to improving how memory is utilized. Simply because IO or disk is actually very slow and we need a way to efficiently fetch large volumes of data from the disk and make it available in the RAM so that the CPU can then do the query processing and return the output and as a result what you'll find is that a lot of the time the memory is actually a component where you have to make trade-offs again as you might probably be aware it's very difficult to size memory you don't really exactly know how much memory you will need and unlike disk or cpus where you know that you're dealing with an old tp system in fact often for cpu it's not really disk or old tp that's the problem it's the licensing that's the problem and disk is again very cheap so it's easy to go ahead and over budget uh, disk in most cases but memory has always been a little bit of a gray area because you don't really understand how exactly sql server would be utilizing that memory and therefore it becomes very difficult to capacity plan for it you know naturally having said that the more the better so the way that sql server works is by ensuring that if you give me 2 gb of ram i will use 2 gb if you give me 50 gb i'm going to use 50 gb and if you give me 2 terabytes i'm going to try and use 2 terabytes as well and that's just good common sense as far as query execution is concerned because the more data that resides in the ram the better the query execution will be simply because we don't have to deal with the underlying physical disk the reason why this is important for us is because when you look at a disk and you look at the time taken to fetch data or write data into the disk, it's often in the order of milliseconds. In fact, a very good configured system will usually be anywhere between 5 to 10 milliseconds. Now, we have advances in uh, storage such as SSDs, etc. that we can use, which will bring that down to maybe a few microseconds. But at the same time, it still doesn't compare with RAM memory. Memory has always been the fastest as far as uh, data transfer is concerned, simply because memory deals with write operations and read operations in nanoseconds compared to the milliseconds that we were talking about with disk. And therefore, the more data in the memory, the better for us. This is why SQL Server memory planning and memory capacity planning, as well as understanding how memory works, is very, very critical to the long life of your system. So let's get right to it. Let's try and understand how data transfer happens inside SQL Server. Now, typically the way that this would work for us is that we would start off with data from a disk going into the RAM. So you normally find your data going like this from disk into the RAM and then from RAM into the CPU. And this is ideally the case that you want all the time because what this means is that you have sufficient amount of RAM available that all the data can be fetched from the disk, inserted into the RAM and then sent to the CPU for processing. Now, that's not always the case, especially today, because we have a lot of these systems that are actually terabytes in size, and therefore it's not really practical for you to have a terabyte of RAM uh, available for a specific table. You might have a couple of terabytes, but at the same time, you've got hundreds of terabytes of database available. So you're not really always gonna be able to fit all of that into the RAM. In these kind of situations, what you typically find is that SQL Server doesn't really always just pick up the data from the disk and put it into the RAM you'll find that during query execution, SQL Server might offload some of that data into the temp DB and then fetch it from the temp DB as needed. This kind of operation is what we would normally call a spill. And what this means is that when the query is being executed, SQL Server is not able to allocate sufficient amount of RAM in order to be able to store all the data. And because it's not able to store all the data in the RAM, it decides to use the temp DB like a page file now, you might be aware of the concept of page file from the Windows operating system, where, again, Windows has this concept of a page file, where if the volume of data, is, uh, if the memory is not sufficient, it offloads some of that memory into a page file. This will, again, become significantly important later on when we talk about something called PMEM devices, persistent memory devices, which is a feature that was introduced in SQL 2019. But we're not there yet, so let's focus on what we have at the moment. What you'll find is that often your tables are so large that they will never really fit in the RAM. 
And in these kind of situations, when you do an aggregation or a group by or an order by, you will find that you need to fetch all the data from the table into a RAM that is not sufficiently large enough to allocate or uh, store all that information. In these cases, SQL Server decides to offload that data into the 10TB and then fetch the data as needed from 10TB at the time of query processing when the CPU needs it. This is what we call a spill and often you will refer it to as a tempdb spill. Now the important thing to understand here is that this is not necessarily a bad thing. You just sometimes don't have enough RAM and therefore you will be forced to spill into tempdb, especially in data warehousing systems where you're processing a large volume of data, maybe a decade worth of information. In an OLTP system, you might see a slightly different variation of the scenario. Typically what you'll find is you have this highly transactional OLTP system and you're expected to rebuild the index. Now, when you rebuild the index, this table is so large that the primary key or the clustered index rebuild is actually simply going to have to rearrange all the data in the table and we don't have enough RAM to hold the contents of the entire table in the first place. In these situations, what you'll find is that the index, when you rebuild it or when you create the index, you have this option of sort in tempdb. What this means is that instead of fetching all the data and putting it into the RAM and then trying to do the sort in the RAM, we tell SQL Server to put the data into the tempdb and then do the sort operation within the tempdb itself and only push the final output out. Again, in these kind of situations, you will find the creation of a work file and a work table, which is basically the stuff that gets created inside tempdb. There are internal tables that are created in tempdb to hold the partial results of uh, these operations. And what happens is that SQL Server is basically saying that I don't have enough RAM, I need some place to put this data, and therefore I'm going to use the tempdb. So you can see how it's not always practical or possible to allocate so much RAM that every operation always happens within the memory itself. Sometimes you will be required to offload that operation into the disk. And the whole point here is that we understand that the disk is so slow that it's often a good idea for us to try and reduce the volume of data being put into the disk by just making sure our queries are written better, our design is uh, normalized properly, and uh, we index the system so that we don't end up having to do uh, a lot of these uh, scans that might cause problems by fetching a large volume of data. So these kind of operations, the, the stuff that developers can do on their end when they design their system and they write their queries, have a large impact in terms of how that data is stored in the memory, right? Uh, a bad index might result in a table scan and a table scan means all the contents of the table have to be residing in the RAM before it can actually be uh, filtered out or read in a way that uh, the CPU can process it, correct? Now, why this is important for us is because when you're working with the CPU, you'll find that uh, the CPU, when we do sys uh, processes or when we're looking at the status of the query, you'll find a number of statuses, correct? So the first status is usually sleeping or background, which just basically means nothing is happening, it's just sitting idle. Then you have the runnable queue. And in the runnable queue, what's happening is that a query is executing and it's taken a token, it's, got, it's gotten into the scheduler and it's somewhere in the queue waiting for access to the, uh, the CPU. At this point, the CPU will probably change the status of that particular thread from runnable, runnable to running, which means that at this point, I'm ready to do some work for that particular query. But because the disk subsystem is so slow, you end up in a situation where the CPU is ready to do some work, but the disk hasn't yet fully finished fetching all the data. And in these kind of situations, what typically happens is you will move on to the next state, which is suspended. In a suspended state, what happens is that the query is kicked out of the scheduler and SQL Server basically tells that query that you need to go finish your disk IO activity first and make sure you have all the data available before you come back to the CPU and uh, start loading your or processing your query. And this is important for us. Now, don't worry if you didn't understand some of the things I just talked about, because uh, I can understand that some of you might actually be watching this video as part of learning SQL Server. So I've often found that when you talk about memory, it's easy to understand how memory works if you try to compare it with the way that the judiciary works. Now, I'm not saying that you need to have some kind of understanding about it, but a basic idea would definitely be able to help you correlate some of the way that uh, the judiciary works with some of the way that SQL Server works. Now, say for example, uh, what we have is basically we have somebody inside the physical disk. So let's say this is you at home and uh, you did a terrible crime and you need to go to court. So what happens typically is that the police will probably ask you to come to the jail 
and the jail for all intents and purposes when we talk about it in this video is basically nothing but the memory right so the disk would be usually the police station the cpu would usually be the court and memory would be treated as jail as far as uh, we're concerned so typically what would happen is you do a crime you move from the police station to the jail and then from the jail you go to the, C uh, the cpu or the court and uh, this is the way that it's supposed to work now often what happens is that the jails are so full that it's not really practical to bring people in because it's already overcrowded in such cases what we do is we give the person bail and they're allowed to stay outside of jail until the cpu is ready to sentence them and that's basically what's happening with the spill what's happening is the memory is already full or doesn't have the capacity to handle all this extra data and because we know that the memory isn't sufficient to handle this data we store it in an interim fashion in the temp db until the memory uh until the cpu is ready to process that information correct and that's what basically happening here so the first time we go ahead and fetch the data from the disk put it into the ram from the ram that data then moves into temp db and that portion of ram is then allocated to somebody else who would probably be uh, more relevant as far as the current execution cycle of the cpu is concerned and this way we are able to make sure that while we have only a limited amount of memory available that memory is able to address the requirement of all the queries that is available uh, that is running on the system and this is basically mainly because of the way that the memory is able to grant bail or basically spill to temp db right and that's what we're trying to explain here. So you'll find that a lot of the time I'll revert to these kind of examples, mainly just to get that concept a little bit more clearer. I'm not sure if this would be the best way to do it, but I find that it works for a lot of the people that I train. And so I'm gonna try and do the same thing for you as well. So the idea here is disk, RAM, CPU. This is the way it's supposed to be. Often not possible simply because we don't have enough RAM. In such cases, we spill to 10 dB and then bring that data back into the RAM just in time for the query's execution. When this happens, queries work fine. When this doesn't happen, the query becomes suspended until the I.O. operation is complete. I hope this video has been sufficiently detailed enough to get you excited about understanding memory in SQL Server. In the next video, we're going to talk about how lock pages in memory work and why that is important for uh, SQL Server. If you don't know, that's a memory permission that we need to grant the application, which in this case is SQL Server, to ensure that the data stays in the RAM and is not kicked out by some other external process. Why is that important? In the next video.